standing before you all today brings back a lot of memories. I actually sat in you guys' seats many years ago. I hate to say many, but many years ago. Now, I did my training as a medic in the United States military to serve as a medic in the Desert Storm War. And when the war ended, I returned back to Mississippi. And I got my first job at the Baptist Hospital right here in Jackson, Mississippi as a medical assistant. I remember the first day, I was so excited. I showed up with my white uniform on and walked up to the head nurse and said, Dr. Quinn reporting for duty. <laughs> she said, who is this guy? <laughs> but I was just so hyped. I was, I was very enthusiastic about the opportunity to be a part of this medical team with the potential to save many lives. I performed my duties as a medical assistant. I delivered the food trays. I basically did the vital signs. I changed the beddings. And I did everything that was in my job description. But over the course of the first few weeks, my motivation began to become less. And a big part of it was, I was starting to question my importance on this medical team. I mean, the, the RNs, they got all the praise. The doctors, they were saving the day, but nobody seemed to really care about Tim, the medical assistant. But on one particular day, all my questions of significance were answered. I was standing at the nursing station, talking to the nurses, getting ready for the shift. And this particular doctor came down the hall. Now this individual doctor, he didn't really speak to anyone. He was very stern. He had never spoken to me before. And he walked straight up to me and said, follow me, son. So I stood up and I followed him to the end of the hall. And we got to this really large supply closet at the end of the hall and he said, come on in, son. So I walked in and he walked in and closed the door. And when that door shut, I, I, I felt my heart almost jump out of my chest. I couldn't breathe. I was like, Lord, what does this man want to tell me? What is he going to do? He looked me directly in the eyes and he said, son, you saved my butt. I was like, sir, what do you mean? So he started to explain the whole reason for bringing me to this closet. And he started telling me about the situation, but he said a name. And when he said the name, oh God, I could breathe again because I knew exactly what he was talking about. He was talking about Ms. Jones. Now Ms. Jones was an older lady from the Delta area. She was very financially compromised. And I would take her her breakfast tray, her lunch tray, do her vitals every day, and she'd talk to me, and she'd tell me about how she's so excited to be in the big city of Jackson. She'd say, this is my second time, Tim. And she was so excited all the time. And, and basically, I noticed, though, when the nurses came in the room and the doctors, she didn't say anything. She got real quiet. But as soon as they left, she started back talking. Well, the deal is, one day she told me that she was not taking her medications. And she told me that she'd hide it underneath her tongue, and then she'd slip it into the toilet. And I asked her, I said, Ms. Jones, why, did, why are you doing this? I said, this is not good. And she explained that these big time doctors and nurses, they don't care about some little old country woman from the Delta. They, they, they don't care if I live or die. And I explained to her, they do care. I mean, this is a hospital. That's the whole purpose is to take care of people such as yourself. But she went on and on. But I pleaded to allow me to let the nurses know what was going on. So she agreed. And as fast as I could, I went to the nursing station. And I reported. Back, you know, back on that day, that doctor in that supply closet explained to me that on that particular day, they had put in orders for the medication to be given IV, meaning directly into her bloodline through her, her veins. 
And the deal is, he explained to me that every day they had been increasing the dose of the medicine because they were under the understanding that she was taking it and she was not responding to it. In that supply closet, he explained to me, had they have given her that medication at that high dose through her IV line, introducing it to her body for the first time at that dose, it could have very well have taken her life. He looked at me and told me that I was the eyes and ears of the healthcare team. The deal is, when you go into your fields, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna always exhibit pride and purpose. And because I took pride in my job as a medical assistant, I, I made sure that I made good rapport with Ms. Jones and talked to her, listened to her, made her feel comfortable. And because of that pride, she, she confided in me that she was not taking her medication. And the confirmation in the closet helped me understand that because I exhibited this pride, I was able to fulfill my purpose of helping my fellow man. So graduates, as you get ready to go into your fields, you have to remember to always exhibit pride and purpose. And it's so funny because I actually overheard a graduate when I was, graduate when I was coming in, and he talked about how much money he was gonna be making. I'm not gonna look at him. But the deal is, when you exhibit pride and purpose in your job, you'll receive a reward that's more valuable than all the money in the world. Perfect example, even today. About a year ago, I was in a Walmart just doing some shopping. And I felt somebody grab me from behind on the toothpaste aisle. I was confused. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> Am I, am I getting mugged or what? So I kind of shrugged off and turned around, and there was a lady before me, and she was a little teary-eyed. And I asked her, you know, are you okay, ma'am? What's going on? And she, she apologized and explained that when she saw me, she became a little overwhelmed for a second because I, quote, saved her life. And I expressed that, you know, I'm, I'm very honored, but I don't know if we've ever met before. And she confirmed that we had never met before, but she started to tell me her story right there on that toothpaste aisle in that Walmart that particular night. She started telling me about her mother that was rushed to the hospital at the age of 59. And she further explained that the mother had a breast mass that she could feel about a year prior to that, but she did not go to the doctor. She even expressed that her mother hadn't been to the doctor in over 10 years because her mother just did not trust doctors. She, would t she told me that her mother would tell her things like doctors are rich and they're driving these big old Mercedes and they, they just, they're not going to get my money. I'm just going to pray about it and God is going to take care of me because I am a Christian. Well, the deal is the mother had fainted and they called the ambulance, and the ambulance took her to the hospital emergency room. They did some tests, and it was determined that she had metastatic breast cancer. And basically, the cancer had spread to distant organs in her body. She was very ill. So they put her on chemo and radiotherapy, but it was, it was too late. I mean, the mother lost a lot of weight. She lost her hair. She, she was very nauseated, vomiting every day, and she died a very miserable death over the next few months. The lady in Walmart explained to me that she was convinced that she was not going to have the fate of her mother, and she was not going to go to doctors because she and her family at that time blamed the medical staff for their mother's death. They felt by going to the hospital, that's why she died. She would have been fine just to stay at home, and that's what they believed at that time. But she reminded me of a particular Sunday that I showed up in her church. And they announced that Dr. Quinn is going to be speaking on breast cancer. So she 
sat right up front to pay attention because of the history with her mother. And she reminded me how I spoke of how getting diagnosed early can save your life. But she also quoted me saying, going to the doctor is not turning your back on God, but celebrating God's mercy by using people and technology to perform his miracles. She told me that she left the church that day and she thought about going to the doctor, but she wasn't 100% convinced, but she was thinking on it. Well, she, she also told me that the next morning she was driving to work and she said she heard me on the radio talking about breast cancer on her, on her radio in her car. And she was like, oh, Lord, doctor, this, 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 this Dr. Quinn man, Dr. Quinn man, God must be using him to talk to me, try to tell me something. Well, she was almost convinced, but not quite yet. But then she told me that two days later, she was sitting in her living room, and I appeared on her television, talking about going to get a mammogram and a physical and breast cancer. She was convinced. She said, God is using this Dr. Quinn, man, so I'm going to go ahead and get this physical. And she called her doctor's office and basically scheduled an appointment, the doctor's office on her insurance card that she had been holding on to for all these years and not using. She went and got a physical. She followed up with a mammogram as suggested. But she got a call a few days later, letting her know that the mammogram was abnormal. She followed up with the specialist as suggested. They did a number of tests to include something called an ultrasound guided biopsy. The tissue samples were sent to the pathological laboratory and the report came back that there were very, very aggressive precancerous cells. But the good news was all the surrounding tissue was cancer free. They followed up with some diagnostic tests to include different type of radiological tests and it was determined that the cancer had not spread to any distant organs or lymph nodes. They told her that her life was saved. They further explained that because of the history of her mother having aggressive cancer that had spread all over the body and the type of cells on that pathological report, there was a very high probability that she would have had the same fate as her mother had she have not gone and gotten that exam. I left that Walmart that night with a confirmation once again. Because of my pride in my work, I worked hard in my clinic to see patients every day. But my pride in my work took me outside of my clinic to work in the churches. I actually did a talk in this church about three weeks ago about hypertension and heart disease standing right here. But also, my pride had me to work very hard every day, tirelessly, and it helped me to confirm that by helping my fellow man, that lady in Walmart, I was fulfilling my purpose. And graduates, I stand before you today to confirm, if you exhibit pride and purpose in your jobs when you graduate, I'm looking at the young man talking about the money again, if you exhibit pride and purpose when you graduate, the reward will be something that money cannot buy. Now, for each of the graduates before me today, when I, when I list your occupation that you're going into, I want you to rise up and stand on your feet, like in the military. On your feet! All right, hold on, we're going we're gonna to wait now. For my medical assistants, on your feet! I want you to imagine, and I want you to remain standing, I want you to imagine exhibiting pride and purpose in your jobs to be the eyes and the ears of the healthcare team. All right, remain standing. Dental assistants, on your feet. I want you graduates 
to imagine exhibiting pride and purpose on your jobs so that you can help with the diagnosis and treatment of cavities, even in little children, so they can sit in class free from dental pain, pay attention, and perform well in school. All right. Welders, on your feet. I want you to imagine exhibiting pride and purpose on your jobs to weld buildings, to weld, to weld bridges that cross large areas of water so families can travel across these bridges and, 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 and occupy these buildings safely to reach their destinations. Truck drivers, on your feet. I want you to imagine exhibiting pride and purpose in your jobs. So on a night at 3 a.m. when it's raining, you're driving an 80,000 pound truck safe from collisions and accidents with other cars on the streets. Heating and air conditioning technicians on your feet. I want you to imagine exhibiting pride and purpose in your jobs to keep families warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Cosmetologist, on your feet. I want you to imagine exhibiting pride and purpose in your jobs like my father that was a cosmetologist, to help people feel better about themselves and build up their confidence to be successful by helping them to find their outer beauty. Delta Tech graduates, I salute you. And I ask that you remember to always exhibit pride and purpose in your jobs. Thank you very much.